they go out to their own service. It's an honor to be up here today. Um, I realize that I've only been here six or seven months, and there's still a lot of you that I don't know very well. So I'm honored that Pastor Darren trusts me enough to stand before you and talk, because I'm a crazy youth pastor, and my style is a little different from him or probably any other pastor in the country, because I am more comfortable with teenagers, and I like to be crazy and not be taken so seriously. So it's an honor to be here today, and I'm just thankful that you guys would allow me to stand before you to preach the Word of God. I want to thank my parents for coming. They drove up very early this morning (laughs) to be here. So it means a lot to me. Uh, If you you haven't met them, you should meet them. They're pretty awesome. (laughs) They stood by me through a lot. Um, So this morning, our text is going to come from Zechariah chapter 2. If you would like to open up your Bibles. I'm missing my Bible. If anybody has seen it, I've been missing my Bible for two weeks. If you have any idea where it's at, please let me know. So if you want to open up your Bibles or your app on your phone or your iPad or however you choose to see the Word of God, um, we'll be picking up in Zechariah chapter 2. So at this time with the book of Zechariah, Zechariah is actually the author of it. The prophet Zechariah writes this chapter. And the Jews have been spread out through all the land. They've kind of lost their own territory, their own area. And uh, God has sent a prophet to, again, address the people with what's going on and to encourage them. Um, In fact, the name Zechariah means God remembers or Yahweh remembers. And so the fact that Zechariah is here and he's trying to talk to them, he's letting the Jews know that God remembers them. He hasn't forgotten them and he's bringing them in. And that message, I believe, still applies to us today, is that God doesn't forget us. He still remembers us, and he's still trying to to speak to us today and to bring us in. Uh, So we'll pick up in Zechariah 2, verse 1 through 5. He says, When I looked up, there before me was a man with a measuring line in his hand. I asked, Where are you going? And he answered me, To measure Jerusalem, to find out how wide and how long it is. While the angel who was speaking to me was leaving, another angel came to meet him. And he said to him, Run, tell that young man, Jerusalem will be a city with... Because of the great number of it, number of people and animals in it. And I myself will be a wall of fire around it, declares the Lord, and I'll be its glory within. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for your word this morning. I thank you for your words that are written down that we can learn from today. Lord, I pray that you would be the glory within us. Open our hearts to hear what you have us to hear today and show us how to apply it and what we need to change to live a better life as you got. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, I, again, being faster, like to start off with a story. And most stories that are relatable have to be personal. So, um, just a little story about me. When I was a senior in high school, I was very much more type A personality than to let go a little bit. But I like to plan. I like to know what's going to happen. I like to know the next 10 steps, but not only do I like to know the next 10 10 steps, I like to know how those 10 steps are going to happen, walk through them, and know every detail. So when I was a senior and change was coming very fast and I was going to have to graduate and have to leave my family and go somewhere, anywhere, I didn't know where, but I knew that it was coming, it scared me because I had had this plan since I was little that I wanted to be a doctor. I wanted to go to medical school. My parents, my dad said my whole life, you're going to be the doctor. You're going to be the person that takes care of my retirement. That's what I wanted. (laughs) He really says that, ask him. (laughs) And that's what I wanted. But then, you know, God kind of throws a wrench in the plan. And when I was 15, he said, you're going to be a missionary. You're going to speak to people. You're going to spread the gospel. You're going to share the truth. So I went home from camp that summer, and I took it seriously, and I started planning. This is what I'm going to do. So as I'm approaching my senior year of high school, I said, all right, if God wants me in the ministry, and I want to be a doctor, I'm going to make it work. I'm going to be a medical missionary. (laughs) So I planned it all out. I looked into different medical programs at UK and Vanderbilt. I didn't really look at U of L, no offense. But (laughs) I planned it out. I wanted to do something that I could take medicine and 
somehow pair that with the gospel and get into countries. And it sounded perfect to me. That just made sense in my head. I knew what I was supposed to do. But the more that I tried on my own, I was trying to make it work. I was trying to get into these programs. I was not doing very well in my physics class, and I knew I had to take physics in medical school. And I was trying so hard, and it stressed me out to no end. I was trying to make it work. And my youth pastor, he just, he sits back, and I, he didn't stress over it. He looked at me, and he was like, what are you doing? Why are you stressing? Don't worry about it. Just pray about it. I'm like, I did pray. I promised I prayed. I just need to make sure it's all going to work. And it, 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 it was trying on my own, and it wasn't going to work. So one night we were hanging out with um, all of my youth group, and I had gotten into the routine of asking everybody's advice. You know, where should I go? What should I do? How do I make this work? You, I mean, you can ask my parents. I was stressed to the core. I wasn't sleeping. I was tossing and turning every night. And I'm just, I mean, we're talking like September, October, November of my senior year. I had months to figure it out. Not me. <laughs> I wanted to know what was happening, and I knew that there was a change coming. And I stressed about it. And so I'm hanging out with my youth, with my youth friends that night, with my youth pastor, and Pastor Josh Cosby, shout out to him, awesome job with me, because he put up with my stress. But he, he just casually brought it up, and he's like, so Hannah, you're leaving in a few months? Yes, I'm, I know, I'm aware of that. I don't like change. Yeah? So you've got all the advice? He knew. I had asked everybody their opinions. I went around my church, asked every person on staff. I went to my teachers, asked them what I should do. I asked my friends, I asked my aunts and uncles. And the thing is, everybody, everybody had a different opinion. There was no pleasing one person. Everybody said, well, you need to go here. And then the next person would say, no, you need to stay home. And then I got a call from another pastor who says, hey, I have an opportunity for you to do missions if you want to live two years in France, but I need to know in the next two months. I'm like, I don't know what to do. <laughs> it's stressing me out. And I didn't want to mess it up, but I wanted to make sure that I got it perfect for God. And I tried so hard. And the, the pressure just came in. And I wanted to measure up to everybody's expectations of me. And I thought that everybody expected me to please them and do what they wanted me to do. But in reality, I was just wanting to live up to my own expectations of myself. I had put too much on myself. And Pastor Josh, when he, we continued on that conversation, he looked at me and he said, have you prayed about it the way that you talk about it? Immediately, I wanted to jump up and defend myself. Well, of course I've prayed. I know what I'm doing. But that wasn't true. I had prayed, you know, God, tell me where to go. But then I would go and ask everybody else. I wouldn't ever actually sit back and say, God, what am I supposed to do? How do I get through this? And I waited. And so I went through a season of time, drove out to Central Bible College with my mom, toured the campus, absolutely hated it, didn't want anything to do with it. My mom looked at me and she said, I have a feeling this is where you're going to be. I can see you here. Said, There's no way this is going to happen. <laughs> I wasn't on board with it. And I knew that God had a plan and I just, I wanted to fix it myself. I wanted to measure up. I wanted to be all the things that I had dreamed about and that I thought other people wanted for me. But I was trying to measure up to other people's expectations of myself and that wasn't the case. And so I went home after that trip to Central Bible College at the beginning of a very cold December. And I fasted and I prayed for two weeks. And it was so supernatural in the way that for those two weeks, all my stress was gone. You know, I wasn't caring so much about what other people's opinions were. I wasn't trying to measure up. And I zeroed in on God, and I leaned into his voice. And for two weeks, I only asked God what he wanted me to do. And when I woke up Christmas morning, I just knew, without a shadow of a doubt, that Central Bible College was the place I was supposed to be. And it had to be a God thing, because two weeks prior to that, I told my mom I was not going to that school. And I told my youth pastor I was not going to be there. But the thing is, I was trying to measure up to other people. And when I zeroed in on God, and God had a plan for me, and he had a way for me to go, and it wasn't me trying to, to measure up to it. And so when I leaned in, God revealed that, and it took away all of these walls that I had built up, all the, the times that I tried to make things happen on my own, to force it to work. But God came in, and he tore that down one by one, and he said, listen, don't worry about it. Just follow me. And I can tell you, it has been completely different, tested my boundaries since I was 17, now almost 26, 
and I don't stress about it as much. I still like to know what I'm doing and how I'm doing it, but God took me and he showed me that I was trying on my own will. I was trying to measure myself up to what other people compared to, and he showed me that he has a plan and that he's going to make a way if I just listen to him and follow after him. So that's what is happening in a similar way with the Israelites right now. When Zechariah saw that, that prophecy, he saw a man standing there trying to measure up. He's preparing to build a wall for Jerusalem. Now, back at this time, there were cities were common to have walls built around them. That's their number one line of defense. They wanted, you guys might remember from Joshua and Jericho, you know, Joshua took the Israelites to fight the battle at Jericho, and there were walls around. That was common for them, because if a city did not have walls, they were vulnerable to attack. They did not have a defense ready. They knew that they could lose everything. So anytime there was an establishment back 6,000 years ago, however, however many years ago, they had to put walls up to defend themselves, to measure up. And that's what this man is doing. He's going out and he's saying, something's happening with Jerusalem. Something's going on with the Jews. We have to build a wall. We need to measure it. We need to know how far up we have to protect ourselves. And God is looking at him and he says, I will be that wall. I don't want Jerusalem to have a wall. So I'm talking to you guys this morning because I want you to think, what walls have you built up in your life? What ways have you tried to measure things up to what other people have said or to what you expect of yourself or to other people? You've built them up, but when God says, I want to be your wall, what have we got? Where are we at with it? <clears throat> so God looked at them and he said, I want to be the wall of fire. I want to protect them. You can imagine Zechariah hearing at first saying, don't build that wall. <laughs> Tell him to stop. Zechariah is going to be a little panicky. You know, wait a minute, God. We, we have to have this defense set up. You know, we're trying. We're measuring up. We're, we're preparing. And then God says, oh, but I'm going to be a wall. I'm going to be a wall of fire. So that resonates immediately to those that are living at this time period because what a lot of hunters and travelers would do as they're walking through the land, going from city to city or town to town, what they were accustomed to is that at night when they couldn't travel anymore and they would make a campsite what they would walk around their campsite and they would light a wall of fire around their campsite and that wall of fire was to prevent any of the wild animals or people that you know bandits that could have been traveling at that time no they knew that nobody would try to cross over a wall of fire to get to them because then it would have hurt them and so this is commonplace happening at this time that Zechariah was living in for centuries later as well. But he knew what, it, what a wall of fire meant is that nobody was going to be able to cross over into that without hurting themselves first. So when, when God cries out and he says, I'm going to be a wall of fire for you, they knew. All right. That's what it is. The enemy can't come in because if he tries, he's going to get hurt. So what happens is God is asking them to be vulnerable with him. He wants them to be ready to not have a defense, to depend on him. And that's scary for us. I don't like the word vulnerable. I don't like tearing down my walls and not being ready for something. But when it comes to God, that's exactly what he wants. He wants us to be vulnerable with him because he wants to be our defender. He wants us to depend on him. See, man tries in vain. I tried very hard to play in my own way. I tried very hard looking at other schools and other people's expectations, and it was all in vain because God had a greater plan. The psalmist writes that God's ways are higher than our ways and that his thoughts are higher than our thoughts. And if that's true, why do we try so hard to fix things ourselves? Because if God sees things from a higher level and he knows what's coming, shouldn't it be easier for us to depend on the ways of the Lord versus trying to fix things for ourselves? Easier said than done. I understand. I still try to fix things for myself. I have to pull back the reins a little bit. Come on, Hannah. Let God handle this. But we see God's faithfulness endures so many times throughout the scripture. And I really like to give examples from scripture so that, 
you know, as you read one, you don't think, oh, well, this is a one-time occurrence, because it's not. So, uh, if you would like to flip to Judges chapter 7, we read a story where, again, God starts taking somebody, and he makes them vulnerable so that he can defend. He, may, he brings them to a place where they look defenseless so that his glory would be shown. In Judges chapter 7, verse 2, we'll pick up and read about Gideon and see what was happening with Gideon. The Lord said to Gideon, You have too many men. I cannot deliver Midian into their hands, or Israel will boast against me. My own strength has saved me. Now announce to the army, anyone who trembles with fear may turn back and leave Mount Gilead. So 22,000 men left, while 10,000 remained. But the Lord said to Gideon, There are still too many men. Take them down to the water, and I will send them out from there. If I say, this one shall go with you, he shall go. But if I say, this one shall not go with you, he shall not go. So Gideon took the men down to the water. There the Lord told him, Separate those who lap the water with their tongues as a dog laps from those who kneel down to drink. Three hundred of them drank from the cupped hands, lapping like dogs, and all the rest of them got down on their knees to drink. The Lord said to Gideon, With the three hundred men that I lapped, I will save you and give the Midianites into your hands. Let all others go home. So Gideon sent the rest of the Israelites home, but kept the three hundred. I'll stop there. So, Gideon was a judge over Israel at this time, and he's taken Israel to fight against the Midianites. And he has over 30,000 men. So they're comfortable. They've built up an army. They've built up a reason to defend themselves. And God says, no, 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 no. You've got way too many. I'm not going to let you do that, because if you go into battle looking like that with 32,000 men, you're going to think you handled it yourself. Well, God does that with us sometimes. We build things up, and we think we're ready, and he says, oh, wait a minute. Let's pull this out of you. Let's rein you in a little bit, because if you do it on your own, you're going to think that you did it on your own strength when really all things are possible with God, not with man. So Gideon, he went forth with this plan, and God stripped down 22,000 men. I'm sure Gideon was thinking, all right, 10,000, a little shaky, I'm not sure we can do it, but I'm comfortable with 10,000. Maybe that sometimes that happens with us. We start going through a season of depending on God, and he asks us to give a little bit more, to let go of a little bit, but then we're, we get comfortable again. And then God still says, oh no, that's still too much. You still can't do that because I'm still not strong enough in your life. So what happened with Gideon? He asked Gideon to go, basically sent home another 10,000 men and left Gideon with the 300. So I can imagine if I'm Gideon and I realize that I just went from an army of 33,000 to an army of 300, how in the world am I expected to go and defeat an entire city of Midianites? But God does it. If you read later on in the chapter, he sends Gideon to listen to a dream that, that one of the Midianites were having, and he dreamed that the Israelites were coming to defeat him. And that was confirmation for Gideon that God was on his side. And God says, it doesn't take 30,000 men to defeat them. If I'm on your side, it doesn't take anybody. I can do it. And so I say that to you guys today, as you're building up walls, trying to defend yourself, Storing up different things, you know, it looks different in everybody's life, how you're trying to defend yourself. But God wants you to be vulnerable. He took Gideon and those 33,000 men and pulled it down to 300, and he made them vulnerable. They could have been pummeled. They could have been absolutely destroyed. But he wanted them to depend on God, and they knew that it was only by God's strength alone where they have gotten through that. That's the only way that they would have made it. And so God does the same thing with us and that he was speaking to the Israelites. So don't build a wall. Don't measure up. Let me be the defender. Let me be there to fight for you. God is in control, and he wants us to prosper. <clears throat> we see another incident of God's faithfulness with a woman who gave everything despite reality telling her what to do. In 1 Kings chapter 17, Elijah, another prophet, is traveling, and he goes into the town, and he meets a widow and she says that she, you know, it's customary for people to take in and to be hostess and help them. And so he, Elijah comes in and he asks for something to eat or something to drink. And she says she has nothing. In fact, she says she has something so much to the point that she has one meal left. It's just enough for her son 
in her, and she's willing to eat that and go lie down and die. She expected it. She didn't have anything left. So 1 Kings chapter 17, it says, As surely as the Lord lives, I don't have any bread, only a handful of flour in a jar and a little olive oil. I'm gathering a few sticks to take home, make a meal for myself that we may eat it, and die. She was prepared for that. And Elijah said to her, Do not be afraid. Go home and do as you have said. But first, make a small loaf of bread for me from what you have and bring it to me. Then make something for yourself and your son. For this is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says. The jar of flour will not be used up, and the jug of oil will not run dry until the day the Lord sends the rain. So she went away and did as Elijah told her. So there was food every day for Elijah and for the woman and for her family. For the jar of flour was not used up, and the jug of oil did not run dry, in keeping with the word of the Lord spoken by Elijah. So this woman is coming, and she's saying she has nothing else left to give. She can't do it. She's so poor that she's going to die. And she has her son, and she's expecting him to die. And she's just kind of accepted those terms. It's not going to happen. And so God sends Elijah, and he asks more of this woman. He says, give it to me first. Okay, well, I'm that woman. thinking, I don't want to feed you. Like, I don't want to do that. I'm not ready for that. I just need one last meal. Sometimes God's going to bring us to a place where we feel like we have nothing left to give. And we're at a point where we're running out of options, and then God asks us to give a little more. It's like, oh, that's when it's really going to hurt. You know, maybe the 300 men, we had something. You know, maybe we had our materials to build the wall. There's something. But when we're already expecting the rock bottom, we're done, we have nothing left to give, we're accepting death and fate, and God wants you to give just a little more? That's a tall order, God. But she did it. And she was obedient to the word of the Lord, and she provided that bread and that oil. And it says that God's word was faithful and that her flour never ran dry. Miraculously, she had a jug full of flour and a jug full of oil, and it was never gone. God supplied it. God can do that with us. His faithfulness endures. See, so when we're reading, we're not just reading about one incident, one isolated time that this happened and then never again. When you read through the scriptures, you see over and over and over again about how God is the provider and that he defends us and that he cares for us and he wants to meet our needs. But we try on our own and we try to make sure that it's all going to work. And we make it difficult on ourselves. You know, as we're building up these things, these situations in our life, we try to make sure that our bank accounts are sound enough that if there's an economic crisis, we won't hurt. We try to make sure that there's walls built around our hearts so that somebody doesn't get close to us and hurt us again. We try to make sure that we're fit enough so that the, the genetic diseases or sicknesses that come that run through family, whether that be diabetes or whatever, we try to make sure that we strive on our own so that that doesn't come into our life. But man tries in vain, and God is a defender if we lean on him. We have to be vulnerable with God. We have to depend on him, and then his faithfulness proceeds. Because if we try it on our own, we're the ones that get hurt. We're the ones that aren't following after God. His faithfulness endures when we depend on him. If we're not depending on him, well, then we become prideful. But we think we can figure it out for ourselves. If we think that we have a plan and we're good. You know, Proverbs also said that pride comes before the fall. So you're hurting yourself. I'm hurting myself. Been there, done that. Probably going to have to learn that lesson a few more times. So why do we have these two incidences in history with Joshua and, and Gideon, and then a third one with Elijah, where God is faithful. Why is God faithful? What is happening? Why? Well, the sin, we go back to Zechariah chapter 2, and later on down that line in verse 8, it says, For this is what the Lord Almighty says, After the glorious one has sent me against the nations that have plundered you, for whoever touches you touches the apple of his eye. I will surely raise my hand against them so that their slaves will plunder them and you will know that the Lord Almighty has sent me. He calls us the apple of his eye. He's faithful and he, and he wants us to be dependent on him because we are his. He's already claimed us. He's just that gracious heavenly father that loves us. Israel and the Jews were very good at turning their back on God. You know, as we read any time through the Old Testament, it seems like they were never worshiping God. They always wanted to live for themselves. 
But through every season, we see that God is just trying so hard. He's already existing. He's already there. He's already told them that he loves them, but he's still telling them that he loves them. He's still trying to prove to them that he wants to provide for them, to protect them. It's the same thing happens with us. You know, we try on our own. We know that God loves us, but then we try to figure it out for ourselves, and God has to come back in and say, hey, I still love you, still want to do this for you, because you are my child and because I care for you. You are the apple of my eye, and they cannot touch you. And if they touch you, I will destroy them. That's what God is saying. But if we're dependent on him, he's going to fight for us. But we have to be vulnerable, and vulnerable is scary. We have to take that next step. I have these measuring things. Sammy helps me out quite a bit in youth. I couldn't do what I do without him, that's for sure. But, <laughs> so we have like a standard tape measure that I probably still use wrong because I know nothing about construction. <laughs> and then a plum bob. Yeah. Plum bob. Thank you, Sammy. <laughs> and then we have this nine foot measuring stick. I don't really know how to open it. I had to ask Sammy's help. But this thing is huge. And it's not the lightest of equipment either. <laughs> it stands nine foot. So we have different measuring items. And I wanted different measuring sticks because the way that we all measure up in our life looks different. There are different measuring tools to use for construction to build walls, to make sure everything's safe. They'll probably be used over there on Wednesday night. <laughs> But it parallels with our life because we all have different ways of building things in our hearts. Worship team. We prepare and we store up. Like I said before, we try to make sure that our bank accounts are secure so if anything happens, we don't have to worry about that. We build up walls so that we don't get close to people and get our hearts hurt again. But if you're doing that, how do you know that you're not supposed to get close to your coworkers? or your neighbors, because they need the hope of God, because they need Christ in their life. And if you've built up walls around your heart and you're not letting them get close to you so that you can't get close to them, who's going to share the gospel with them? Who's going to be a light in your workplace? Who's going to be a light in your neighborhood? Or who's going to be a light in your children's soccer teams or football teams or whatever sport they play? I'm a fan of soccer, so that's what I go with. But we build up these walls. You know, a lot of counselors, I was reading, a lot of counselors are seeing this trend that uh, people are, you know, addicted to exercise. Great. Awesome. It's awesome to stay healthy. It's awesome to build up your bank account, use wisdom. It's awesome to have safeguards for people to a degree, but too much of anything is bad. And so there's a lot of counselors seeing this trend right now where they're obsessed with CrossFit or lifting or something but they're obsessed so much that it's detrimental to them. It's actually trapping them in. Their fear is that they have this wrong view of their body, that they're never good enough, that they can't protect themselves enough, they can't be strong enough, they can't look the best. And in, in an effort to try to be the best, they're hurting themselves. They're living in fear, and there's no freedom in that. And that's what's happening right now, is that everybody's building up different walls, whether your wall looks like a plumb bob, measuring tape, a giant measuring stick. You're building them up, and God's saying, just be vulnerable with me. Depend on me. Let me be your wall of fire. Let me be there because you're the apple of my eye, and I want to care for you. In the New Testament, we see it again with the widow's might. Jesus is there, and he's watching all these people bring in their offerings in the temple. And then, you know, there's plenty of people around, and they're sharing and boasting about how much they've given. But then you have this widow that comes forward and she just gives two mites. And they kind of, you know, look down on her for giving it. But Jesus says that she is blessed for that. That she gave more than everybody else that day because she gave all that she had. She had nothing left to give. And that brought her to a place where she was completely and solely dependent upon God. Are we like that in our lives? I can say that sometimes I'm not. I'm not fully dependent upon God on some days. I try myself. Trying to make sure that you know, I have everything in order. But we have to remember that we have to be vulnerable with God. Give him control of every area of our life. And he'll see it through. How do we become vulnerable? How do we get to that place? 
there are three things that we can do. We can speak faith. Proverbs 18.21 says that the tongue has power of life and death, and those who love it will eat its fruit. And that's echoed again in the book of James, that there's life and death in your words. If you're speaking over a situation and you're saying, oh, well, I'm never going to make it, or I just don't have enough money, or I'm not fit enough, or I can't, I've been hurt too many times, you're speaking that death into your life. But the Bible says there's also life in our words. So if we speak to a situation, I am prosperous. God, I am the apple of God's eyes. He has a plan for me to prosper. He wants me to succeed. He wants me to be victorious. He's already won the ultimate victory over my life. Why should I settle for anything less? Speak life over your life. And then we act humbly. James 4.10 says, Humble yourself before the Lord, and he will lift you up. Humble yourself before God. Don't go to God with an attitude of pride or arrogance. Come to him. He knows your flaws. It's a vulnerable place. He knows everything you've done wrong, and he loves you anyways. Be real with God. Humble yourself before him. Acknowledge how mighty and awesome and amazing God is. And the fact that he loves us despite all of our flaws and everything that we've done wrong. And all the times that we've betrayed him or walked away from him or tried in vain. And he still loves us. And then ask the Holy Spirit to lead you. Ask the Holy Spirit. Lean into him. That's what I had to do. As trivial as it may sound as a stressed out senior in high school trying to figure out what was going on. It was very real to me. And I was very fed up with it. And I had to take time and I had to lean into the Holy Spirit because I, hadn't, I didn't have my ears tuned into Him and I didn't know what I was doing. That took two weeks of solitude and prayer and fasting. Romans 8, 14 says that for those who are led by the Spirit of God are the children of God. The Spirit you receive does not make you slaves so that you live in fear. Rather, the Spirit you receive brought you about your adoption and sonship. When you ask God into your heart, the Holy Spirit came into your body gave you a new life, and that made you a son of God, a daughter of God. And the Holy Spirit lives there. He's there to speak to you. He's there to help you. Let him lean into that. Pray, ask God to show you, and then rest in that. Believe that God is going to show you what to do. Believe that he's going to show you what people, what walls you're supposed to tear down in your life, what things that you are doing in vain that you need to give control over to God bring into a place where we're vulnerable with him and let him be your defender. So altars are open today. As you guys come forward, if you want prayer for anything, people are here to pray. But I want you guys to take some time this morning to just think about what walls have you put up in vain? How are you trying to defend yourself? What areas is God trying to reach out and say, give me control of that? Let me protect you. Let me be a wall of fire to defend you from anything that would come. Tear down those walls and let God be your defender this morning. Father, I thank you so much for your word, God. I pray that your Holy Spirit would reveal things into our lives. Show us areas that we need to work on, God. Point those out. Father, I pray that you would tear down the walls in our hearts so that we can spread the gospel. Lord, that we can reach people that wouldn't have ever heard your name before, that we can be a light in our neighborhoods, in our teams, in our, in our work environment. God, when we surrender control of things to you, you can do so much more than what we would do on our own. Show us what we're doing in vain. Show us where we're messing up, God, and take control of that. In Jesus' name, amen. The altars are open for anybody that needs prayer this morning.